So, if uh, Karen got to do the Usain Bolt, I guess I have to do the Wonder Woman. Okay. I don't know about you, but I feel pretty powerful. Um, what I'm going to talk, talk to you about is, next slide, but before I, before I do, it has been remarkable to me that I came here and none of us had really seen each other's presentations, but the presentation that I'm about to give is kind of the compilation that started with Nick, then Michael did it, then Caroline did it, and then Alan did it. And now I'm going to talk about roughly the same kind of stuff. So I'm thinking that there's a theme here, and all of us can't be wrong. So as you see, the title of my presentation is Green is Just a Color. So what do I mean by that? Well, I'm going to tell you a story about a gentleman that I met that he and I should have had everything in common, and we truly did, but we ran into one brick wall. And the brick wall was a word, and it was the word green. And it made me realize that simple words that we use every day have been co-opted by ideologues to turn it into code for good and evil. And this just floored me at the time. But I'll, I'll tell you the story, and I'll tell you how I realized it and how I tried to get by it. And more and more words every day are falling prey to this exact same scenario. So first, I'll tell you a little bit of my background. I grew up on a farm and in my dad's small construction company. And we knew and were taught from the earliest age about the care and management of precious resources, right? Water soil, electricity, and of course, money and time, right? Because if you're in a business, money and time is everything about that business. But where my true definition of green came into play and where I learned it was in the military. Um, and I'm someone who really feels that they got a lot more from the military than the military ever gave me. So no one ever needs to thank me for serving in the military because it, is, it changed my life at a time when I needed it and has, has given me so much in the way of friends and stability and knowledge and leadership, communications and teamwork. So when I was a CB officer in uh, Kuwait and Iraq, so before the war we were in Kuwait and then we went to Iraq, we went up there and I really saw firsthand what it looks like to have no natural resources except for that one very, very expensive one that we all use every day and that everybody else has talked about. And that's all they have. They don't have the water. They don't have the um, soil content. They don't have all of those amazing things. But what they do have is that one very treasured resource that they then use to desalinate enough water to have a water park to grow wheat in Saudi Arabia because the, the king decides they want to have Saudi bread. They had a dairy for a while because they wanted Saudi milk in the middle of the desert. And they were using the money from their oil to do all this and accomplish all those tasks. So for me, it just really drove home what it looks like what, and what it could look like if you removed oil from that equation. So we as Seabees have the mission to support the Marine Corps in their maneuver elements, to support the, the Navy Fleet Hospitals, and also the Navy Special Operations Forces. And the way we do that is by building all the bridges to get us to where we're going to go after they've been blown up. So we'll put in a, a temporary bridge, then we'll build a, a new bridge, and we, we do all of this to support base operations and maintenance. And all of you probably know by now, and what Napoleon said famously was that if you're studying war, amateurs study tactics and professionals study logistics. And that was driven home absolutely by the critical vulnerability of our convoys, right? We all know how in jeopardy and how many people have been killed in those convoys, which are hauling fuel, water, food, and ammunition. So we, as CBs, we do logistics and we do construction. One of our missions became to figure out ways to reduce the loads and the amount of stuff flowing down those highways 
to get as many people as we could off the highways, and that's saving lives, right? It, another IED or another rocket attack, it was all dangerous all the time, so that was our mission. Figure out how to stop some of that. So if you think about it, and we got into it, and we worked with the engineers from, I, I'm a Navy engineer, so I worked with the Marine engineers, the uh, Army engineers, the Air Force has engineers, but also the British engineers. And we looked at what the heck is going on, and we found that 70% of what we were hauling was fuel and water. Well, what the heck? Can we accomplish any of these missions in a better way? But if you look at things like the M1A1, the Abrams tank, and at that time, there was an, a tank on every corner in Baghdad protecting our guys. Well, the M1 has to run its jet engine to cool its people and its sophisticated equipment. The M1 gets two gallons per mile traveled. But the M1 is not the biggest user in theater. First of all, they're a low-density, high-value asset. There's not that many of them. But the real consumer, and the one that gets the distinction of being the ultimate fuel guzzler, are all those portable generators that we used. So everybody had a tent. There was tents everywhere full of sophisticated electronics and communications equipment that also had walls this thin. So we were air conditioning in the desert, and it turns out that that is not very effective. So we began looking at all those opportunities, and we started to transition from our very expeditionary uh, move, shoot, and communicate warfare to a more uh, stable environment where there was a little longer term basis. So we set up these transitional bases that eventually evolved into what you see today. And when we did that, we could then go at what has become my definition and my cognitive bias about what green means. Because at that time, it was still a fairly new concept to me. So what we looked at was ways to cut any and every electrical load or water use that we could find. Then we, used, then we looked at ways that we could do what we were doing completely without electricity or water. Then we brought in the highest efficiency portable generators we could find and the highest equipment highest efficiency pumps, anything that we could find that could shrink that load on the generators. We changed the way we worked. We worked more at night. We uh, operated our uh, server tents, or your computers. We had a tent that was for servers that we tried to keep in the desert at 65 degrees. Didn't work. So we followed what the computer manufacturer said, and we let it go up to 85 degrees. Still a challenge, but a whole lot better. We also worked with the contractors who flowed in and worked with us to insulate the tents. So we spray foam, that same spray foam you might see in your house, we spray foam the outside of all the tents. Yes, we, it was biodegradable because we had to throw them all away. None of those tents could come home because they are ruined, but at least they were insulated. And then we could apply solar panels with battery backups to every system that we could find to replace those gas guzzling generators even at high efficiency. We brought in these gem carts, these little electric carts to move around the, the operating bases as much as we could and tried to charge those with solar. We also brought in new technologies for weapon cleaning, weapons cleaning, um, things like that that didn't use uh, very much water, if any at all. So for me, when I got back from Iraq, I had now had this, this passion and this sense for what green really meant. And so did DOD. In fact, they, they went to Congress and with other agencies and got the Energy and Independent Security Act passed in 2007. This was all based on what we'd experienced. What that tells us to do is that all of our bases have to get to net zero energy by 2050. So that means we have to generate the same amount of energy on base or from someplace else that we've set aside to generate that energy as we use. That's an amazing concept and the technology is not there, but we have to have these stretch goals in order to drive things like this. And then the other part of the military is you always want to train like you fight. So if we train to be green back home, we're going to fight green. So when I retired from the Navy in 2008, I got my dream job. I went to work for a guy named Amory Lovins. You'll see him right there. He's one of Time Magazine's 100 most influential people. He started a an institute called the Rocky Mountain Institute in Boulder, Colorado, and in Snowmass, Colorado, that is a green think and do tank. So we worked with people across industry and within DOD on this issue of reducing energy, reducing resource consumption. 
his book you'll see right there, Reinventing Fire, is his latest, just came out this year. It's a roadmap on how to get off imported energy led by business for profit because he doesn't believe that the regulations will ever, will ever flow. Um, he believes that there's profit in mega barrels, so that's energy avoiding. And as you can see, we worked on things like the Empire State Building and saved 40% of the energy that they had. We also had a bunch of avoided costs. They didn't have to tear up Fifth Avenue when they, re they would have had to replace the boilers that they had with these other much larger boilers. But by doing what we did with the windows and everything else in the building, we avoided having to tear that street up, which saved a great deal of money. And Tony Malkin, the majority shareholder in the building, rents that space for much higher premiums than he used to. So that's when it happened, right? I was at Rocky Mountain Institute. I was giving presentations like this. I was up in Fort Collins because I also started a PhD program at Colorado State. I was really excited, and I met this guy. Um, he was an old guy, but he'd been a Marine in Vietnam. And he'd not only been a Marine, but he was a gunny in Vietnam and came back. So he was an amazing Marine, mid-70s, but he was as lean and mean as a 10-penny nail. He was just a great guy. Um, but he was rather subdued, as farmers are, which he turned out to be a farmer. Um, but when he found out, oh, you were in the military, okay, what did you do? Oh, you supported the Marines. Oh, okay. Were you in Iraq? I said, yes, I was. Oh. So then we instantly had this bond, something in common that he wanted to talk about. What was it like? You know, obviously it was a lot easier than Vietnam. O old guys, that's just how they are. It's always easier. And, you know, he was probably right. Oh, it's an email war. You just send an email and they kill somebody. Well, <laughs> not always. So, um, but I really, you know, this guy was amazing. So I, I talked to him, but then he just kept getting more and more amazing, right? He had retired uh, from the Marine Corps and took his family farm in Wyoming over from uh, his father who was ailing. So what he started talking about is how he grew those crops, as you've heard in those other presentations, in this diversified. So he grew wheat, but not just wheat, sorghum and soybeans and corn, and he grew all these diversified crops, and he was crop rotating, and he was doing all the stuff that would have completely prevented the Dust Bowl. I'm like, wow, this guy is amazing. And he talked about his livestock, right? He had, he had beef cows that he grew for food, for meat, and for their hides. He didn't waste anything. Some went to dog food, all this. He just talked about how he utilized everything. Same with the chickens, right? Eggs from chickens, but he also sent the feathers off to be made into pillows, and he ate the birds who were beyond their capacity to keep laying eggs. He even raised rabbits. Rabbits he used for meat and their hides too. It was amazing. The goats were his nature's lawnmower, he said. And he said, you know, he's a Marine, and he's never going to milk a goat. Just not going to happen. But he could have. Then he went on and he talked about how he and the farmers around him had formed a co-op and put this plot so they could conserve water, kind of in the middle of where all their 200-acre plots came together. They carved out five acres, and they all worked and they all grew this garden together. So then they all harvested together because it was five acres. That means you have large enough tracts of vegetables that are too big for any one family. But when they combined all their families, it was great, plus they sold whatever excess they had at the local farmer's market. Wow, this guy is amazing. And then they canned the stuff for the winter, and he was talking co-op and all that stuff. This guy was the epitome, to me, of permaculture, which I, I had learned at RMI, and I was, it was one of the things that I was trying to get, get across to people. But what happened next really blew me away. So, okay, so you do some stuff with livestock. You, you're good with crops. Um, you, you do this little garden thing. But he and his friend, who had the dairy farm, so that was where all that milk exchange came from, had actually set up a bioreactor that was part of the dairy that took the waste from the cows and made biodiesel. They powered all of their, um, their cars, their farm equipment. They powered everything with this biodiesel. It was amazing. So now, as a big green consultant, I wanted to contribute. So I threw in, hey, you, you, do you ever have any extra biodiesel? You ever think about using that in a generator? Power your house or your barn? And he said, no. Why would we want air pollution in Wyoming? Air pollution in Wyoming. Come to California, my friend. <laughs> so next, he said, this is how I do it. I do, I do my house and my barn and all the stuff with solar. So I have a solar with a battery system. 
and I'm off the grid. I don't trust the grid. You know, I don't trust that stuff. But a really even cooler thing that I may not have time to get into, but he had bought from the railroad, you know those old timey reservoirs that you see in the old movies that swing over and fed the steam trains. So he had that and he had a windmill. So he used this windmill that charged up some of the batteries that powered his house and his barn and all stuff. But at the same time, it was driving a small pump that filled that reservoir up. So then when it wasn't windy, he brought the water from the reservoir back down a pipe with a micro turbine in it and turned that micro turbine to charge those batteries. He had built himself a water battery. What an amazing guy. I'm like, wow. And that, that's his 100 plus, or that's not it, but it's an example of a 100 plus year old well that was still crystal clear because of something I'll show you in a minute. So his septic system, a normal septic system that leaches out into the land and, and cleans your stuff if you live out in the country and you don't have access to the sewer system, um, it, it's successful. But what this guy did, he went to the local library in Wyoming and looked up Living Machine, which is a patented technology, and built his own version of the Living Machine. So he had these ponds and habitat and all this stuff just for a septic system. So that was it for me. I'm like, holy cow. I, you are amazing. I want, if you'll let me, I'd like to come to your house, take pictures of your systems that you designed, and then if you will, if you could come and speak with me, I would love to have you tell them your story. And I said, you are the greenest person that I have ever met in my life. And that's when it happened. His reaction was, what? He just looked at me like, what? And I, you are the greenest person I've ever met. And he said, shook his head and he said, I did not know that you were one of them. Yeah. No, he's not coming anywhere. And I'm like, one of them? What the heck is that? One of who? What are you talking about? One of those green people, right? One of those green people trying to kill our economy. You're one of those green liberals who wants to take away my truck and make me drive a toy car with a battery. You're one of those green socialists who doesn't want me to eat my own cows and wants me to eat tofu. <laughs> You're one of those, those green BSs that want, wants me to, you want to take away my guns and my Bible. I'm like, oh my gosh, what the heck? How did, you know, it was the twilight zone for me. I, I didn't know what the heck to do. So I stood there, and as I stood there, mouth agape, he did in the Marine Corps, I think we have a Marine in here, did a perfect about face and walked off in a power position <laughs> because he had just dressed down one of them, the, the people he probably screams nightly at the TV to. Um, and I, I, I honestly didn't know what to do. I didn't know whether to confront him, stop him, say, hey, what the heck was that about? What a crazy rant. Um, but this guy was a combat Marine veteran from Vietnam. And even if he didn't respect me, he deserved my respect. So I let it go. But it, it ate at me for a long time. So as I got older, um, like we all do, I got a little more politically savvy and I, I understood that um, where he was coming from was where we all come from with these words that have been used by our society to create this complete win-lose scenario, right? Everything, it's all overload. Any minute out there you'll have a, a TV spokesmodel or a a ranting radio megalomaniac going at you to tell you what to think and to give you opinions and replace those with facts. So for me, I realized that people are starting, especially with the, the media we have now, you can always go get validation for whatever biases you bring. You don't have to look at the facts. You don't have to look at the truth. There's no more integrity or accountability left in our system. And I, I started to understand where he's coming from, and I started to go, wow, what, what can I do about it? How can I think about it differently? How should I have approached him in a way that would not have completely shut him down from me? So I went back to when we were kids, right? When you're kids, you, learn, you learned your colors, your numbers, and green was just a color between blue and yellow. It wasn't a code. It wasn't a slur. It wasn't a badge of honor. It was just a color. So from that, on the Temecula theme, I thought of it this way that those people who derive their power from dividing us use this mist of words to win at all cost. They've created green as a symbol of good or evil, and we don't have to play their game. If you want climate change, talk to a native Alaskan. Do you think they deal with that? If you want social programs, clean coal, all that stuff. It's in the words they're trying to use against us. 
Progressives, they love to conserve, right? Conserve is the, is the root word for cons, uh, conservatives. Same with conservatives. Show me a, a conservative that is all business who's against progress, the root word of progressive. So with that, I'd like to challenge you to leave here to be a skeptic about these words they're using to push us apart. Search for the, the truth and use your intelligence to determine whether it's the truth or whether it's somebody has an agenda with what they're trying to tell you. And look at it as an American first, not as a member of this tribe or that tribe or this party or that party. Look at it as an American. And like the Losueno Native American word, Temecula, be that sun shining through the mist. Because green is just a color.